Hi, I'm Kang, remastered, and don't mind the new face. I just needed something to make the difference between the old me and the new me noticeable, whether it be a good change or a bad. Jesus, that's the only big change they can make, huh? Spider-Man PS4, one of my favorite and most played games of 2018 next to a certain cowboy game that made me cry and a certain fighting game that made me rage. Spider-Man PS4 was a fantastic superhero game. One of the best, no doubt. Better than the Arkham games, now that's a question for another time, but that's beside the point. Because despite the Arkham series, it was fantastic in its own right. A great story, fantastic gameplay, incredible world, amazing graphics, Spider-Man PS4 had it all and still looks fantastic to this day, which is why it makes no fucking sense that it got a remaster two years later. Now remasters are a special thing, usually something reserved for old games that were great at the time but are starting to show their age. You know, not a game that released two fucking years prior that still looks fantastic as a sorry excuse to make a four hour long expansion $60 Sony, you fucking- Just look at comparisons of the two, it is evident that this game did not need a remaster considering the fact that the biggest difference made is the lighting looks a little bit nicer. Well done, you took a page from Skyrim's book of game design, which is a book that you should not read. And they turned the 23-year-old Peter into a 14-year-old prepubescent off-brand Tom Holland that looks like he's about to graduate middle school. This is a change that I hated back in 2020 and I still hate now. And it's obvious the only reason it was done was to make a clear distinction between original and remaster. And if you have to go to those extremes to make a distinction, how about you just don't make the remaster? Now, admittedly, this hasn't been confirmed by Insomniac, and maybe this isn't why they changed his face. I mean, the senior game designer gave a different explanation. According to them, it was because they had more expression with this new face over the old. So that was a fucking lie. The new face has, in fact, far less emotion than the old one, so I don't know what the fuck they were talking about. But I mean, whatever, I like the old face better, but who cares, you're wearing a mask for three-fourths of the game, so it won't kill me. Aside from the lighting and the face, this remaster is the same thing, same great story, gameplay and all, so it's still worth your time. It starts off great, throwing you right into the action, taking down Fisk right off the bat, who I always forget isn't fat, just buff, which explains why he's able to survive getting shot in the chest, or run over by a car, or standing on an explosion. Yeah, Fisk's power has never made much sense to me, but that's beside the point, the opening is great. As much as I love slow burn openings that slowly introduce you to all the characters and the story, I also really like when a game just instantly throws you into it. It's a fantastic and fast paced level that does a good job at introducing you to the game's world and some of its characters and its main gameplay loop, which is the fantastic combat. I love this game's combat. I've always seen people complain that, oh, it's just a ripoff of the Arkham games combat, and I mean, yeah, why are you complaining? If you're making a superhero game with a character who fights in a similar way to Batman, why the fuck would you risk making any other combat system when you have the perfect blueprint already? I mean, what would you prefer, them copying the Arkham style? Or them using the Avengers style? I rest my case. And even still, the game doesn't really completely copy the Arkham combat if you want to go on technicalities. It's more akin to Spider-Man 2 on the PS2 with dodges instead of counters. And honestly, I prefer counters, but dodges are fine too. It's far more polished than the PS2 version, obviously. As great as that combat system was at the time, going back to it today, I have to admit that it was pretty bare bones and clunky as balls at the time. Here they've taken the skeleton of that combat loop and expanded it by a massive amount, allowing you to do a bunch of fancy tricks. Uppercut a guy in the air, beat the shit out of him, launch him 100 meters, kick another guy, break his spine, web up another guy and launch him into the wall, then punch a dude with a shield completely ruining your flow. I fucking hate you and the semen that you came from. They throw in a vast variety of enemy types in this game to spice up its combat, such as dudes who throw Molotovs. They definitely spice things up. Same with this rocket launcher. You've got the dreaded aforementioned thugs with shields and weapons that annoyingly block all your hits, forcing you to break their fucking jaw by upcutting them into the stratosphere. God, just anyone who blocks you and completely ruins the flow of your combo, just fuck off and fuck that bonk noise that happens when you hit their shield. There's also the brutes who can be pretty annoying in the beginning when you're not upgraded, especially with their spam punching. Jesus Christ, for a fat fuck, you've got insane stamina. But later on, when you get upgrades like this sweet little baby, you can hilariously just web them up and launch them around like a 400 pound cannonball, murdering anybody in their way. 
But if you want to talk annoying, you haven't heard of a thing called the whip. Fuck you and the glowing leather strap in your hand, you cock blocking mother Now at face value, these guys aren't that big of a deal. Just dodge their attacks at the right time and beat the shit out of them. But where they get annoying is when they decide that they don't like you in the air and decide to slam you down to the ground. I'm trying to combo somebody and there goes this motherfucker in the corner of my screen dragging me down to Satan. But they're nothing compared to the definition of annoying, Sable Agents, who are introduced halfway through the game and all of a sudden it feels like I'm playing the Avengers. The regular guys are fine, they don't have any annoying tactics, they get knocked off fairly quickly. Everyone else can suck it. Bullet sponge armored motherfuckers, oh my god, just die. Doing a Sable base with six waves of these bullet sponge fucks is not safe. It is a one-way ticket to carpal tunnel because my thumb legitimately hurt after how much I had to spam square to take out all these guys. Insomniac, you will be hearing from my lawyers that I don't have after I deal with my newly diagnosed arthritis. But that's nothing compared to what I'm gonna do for creating these annoying ass bullet sponge jetpack motherfuckers. Get on the ground, you annoying- The guys with the katanas are pretty cool though. All the demon enemy types are cool and I really like their effects. Good job with that one. And the last enemy type that I haven't mentioned yet because they're my least favorite enemy type, and this may surprise you, is the thugs with guns. Now I don't hate them because they're too hard or anything like that, no that's reserved for these guys. The reason they're my least favorite enemy type in the game is actually the exact opposite. It's because they're far too easy and completely ruin this game's stealth sections. A massive part of what makes the Arkham game so beloved to me and so many others is its fantastic stealth. Still some of my favorite stealth in any game to this day, especially in Arkham Knight where they just perfected it with all the different gadgets and enemy types. And you may be thinking, well, Spider-Man does that too. It also has stealth sections. You can be unique with how you take out the thugs. They give you gadgets such as the trip mine, and that's it. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is if I get caught, I don't get fucking mowed down by a hail of bullets in 2.5 seconds. The thing about Arkham Stealth is, while it gives you all the tools to be a badass and take everyone out in creative ways, the game makes sure you know that at any moment if you mess up, your life will end before it can even flash before your eyes, especially on the harder modes. The fact that you always know that you're one mistake away from either losing a fuck ton of health or instant death in the Arkham games makes the stealth infinitely more tense and forces you to think before you act way more. Meanwhile, here in Spider-Man, I could not care less whether I get caught or not during this game's horrible stealth sections, because Spidey can just casually dodge all the bullets shot at him when he gets caught. Which, yeah, is comic accurate, but it sucks in terms of gameplay. When you realize how little of a threat there is with getting caught, any tension is instantly lost when you know that you could just hop down there and beat everyone's asses quicker and easier. The only time stealth is a tiny bit tense is when you get a fail safe if you get caught. And even then, that's arbitrary. The threat of getting gunned down in a millisecond is way more effective than, oh no, I have to look at this game over screen now. And let's not even get into the hilarious, silent takedown animations. Must be my imagination. Batman sneaks up on a guy and silently chokes them out, so it makes sense that nobody hear him. Sure, it can be a bit ridiculous when you're two feet away from someone and they don't hear their buddy struggling at all, but it makes more sense than kicking the living shit out of somebody and then loudly screaming and nobody realizes. Look, I get it. It's far harder to create stealthy gameplay for Spider-Man than someone like Batman whose whole thing is stealth. So I understand that this is the best that Insomnia could do, but if I'm being honest, I would have preferred that they just stuck with this game's strengths, which is the amazing hand-to-hand -hand combat, and just completely remove the stealth sections because they do not work. We all know Spidey's character, he's not the type of guy to sneak around corridors silently taking people out. I mean, the guy wears a bright red and blue outfit for fuck's sakes, he sticks out like a sore thumb. So I feel like it would have been far better to just ditch the stealth, 
leave that to batman and go all out on your combat which is kind of what they tried to do considering that thugs with guns are in regular combat which can give some really funny moments like watching a thug fire a hail of bullets at their own buddies with blood literally coming out of their bodies but they end up perfectly fine he has kevlar don't worry about it although i'm not sure how well kevlar can protect against getting punched off a skyscraper uh shake it off don't worry spider-man is a no kill rule but anyways back to the story we got a little sidetracked there talking about the combat so spidey goes out to capture fisk it's a fantastic opening level you get into a bit of a 1v1 with fisk who breaks the table in half with his bare hand he's buff not fat let us never forget he survived an explosion we defeat him send him to jail and to celebrate our victory we go to fucking work fucking work i play video games as a hobby on my free time the last thing I need to be reminded of while playing a video game is the unholy thing known as work. And if you think that going to work in this game is just like a cutscene and then back to playing Spider-Man you go, which is what I thought would happen at first. Maybe you should take the rest of the day off, Peter. Yes, please, so we but could go we'll back to the later. fun parts of this game. I know Doc said take the day off, but I have to figure oh, out- Oh, come on! Well, you'd be wrong in your assumption that work is just a three minute long cutscene before returning back to the fun parts of the game. Because Insomniac wanted this game to be so realistic that they made going to work actually feel like you're going to work by making it as boring as humanly possible forcing you to solve these mobile game puzzles what the fuck were they thinking all right i just got this new gpu off some scalper for nine thousand dollars it's time for me to figure out how i'm supposed to plug it in This is one of the worst parts of this game, and clearly the devs agree considering the fact that they give you the option to just straight up fucking skip it after like 30 seconds. But instead of just removing this useless boring feature, the devs decided to put it in a baffling amount of sections. Seriously, you think you'd be safe from this mechanic after leaving work, but Insomniac finds a way to squeeze it in multiple times an hour. Fix an arm? Puzzle time. Observe some weird chemical trail? Puzzle time track somebody down puzzle time if i wanted to play puzzles i would have gone to the bathroom and downloaded flow on my fucking phone at least it's better than diablo immortal but you solve the first puzzle then another one pops up solve that then another one pops up this is starting to feel like a website trying to confirm if i'm a human but after the third one the arm is working and we're finished doc's been testing new materials for the prosthetics he asked me to review his work if i had time as well dig in now i fucking hate this some more puzzles but this time instead of trying to connect wiring or whatever the fuck this is trying to signify we have to place lines in the correct spots like we're a four-year-old playing with blocks okay thankfully the devs came to their senses and we only have to do one of these before mercifully going back to the fun parts of the game like meeting up with yuri to align one of these assassin's creed towers I'm tired of this mechanic. So these towers essentially behave in the same way they do in every other open world game they're in. You go to them, the camera does a fly around, and then unlocks that section of the map, and now you can see all the objectives there. I mean, it's not the worst mechanic. I'm just tired of seeing it. Even Breath of the Wild had it. Even Elden Ring kinda had it with these maps. I'm shocked Red Dead 2 didn't include Arthur scaling up buildings in St. Denis so he could discover which part of the map Tahiti was located in. It's not the worst mechanic in the world, but I'm tired of it. So during this part of the story, the game is kind of just introducing all the side activities. They started with the Assassin's Creed Towers, and next is Random Crimes, which is actually something I like. Something that always rubbed me the wrong way about the Batman games is the fact that there was never any citizens in any of the games. I mean, for the first two, it made sense. Arkham Asylum takes place in a fucking asylum. It wouldn't make much sense to see Teddy from the grocery store wandering around the halls with a fucking tour guide like this is his summer vacation. It also makes sense for Arkham City. It's a chunk of Gotham that was walled off and turned into a prison city for them to kill each other in. Makes sense that no citizens would be chilling out there other than the occasional political prisoner with very annoying screams. Ah! Help! Stop, please! Someone help me! <laughs> but for the other two games arkham origins and arkham knight um 
it started to feel like they were reaching a bit. And I'm really glad Insomniac wasn't lazy about this and included civilians everywhere in this game. And I'm glad they took advantage of this with the crime system, which was done in some of the other Spider-Man games, but way better here. Occasionally, as you're web-slinging around the city, a little triangle will appear on your radar and police will announce a crime that's currently occurring. These crimes range from ones where you just have to beat people up such as robberies, assaults, shootouts, these annoying fucks, and drug deals where Spidey's response to someone smoking a blunt is to give them multiple concussions when he's feeling nice, or punt them off a skyscraper if he's feeling mean. To car chases where, you know, you chase down cars, as the most accurate passenger in the world fires pistol shots in a speeding car at a speeding Spider-Man and somehow nails every bullet with ease. Seriously, you are currently traveling hundreds of miles an hour, is your passenger dead shot? Car wrecks also happen, which makes no fucking sense. I mean, you have a tipped over car, that can happen in a car wreck, and you have a car that has random objects perfectly blocking the driver's door. Number one, how did those objects get there? And number two, you have three other doors to escape from. Get out of those ones. Also, maybe it's the fucked up part of my brain, but for some reason I find the failsafe for the car wrecks to be really funny. Jesus Christ! Moving on before I look insane, we have kidnappings where for some reason thugs decide to kidnap a person and leave them in a parked car. I don't know what their end goal was here. Why would you kidnap someone and leave them chilling in a car screaming for help? Sounds kind of intuitive, but I'm not a criminal. <laughs> I swear I'm not a criminal. My favorite of these crimes have to be the Bomb Squad ones, and honestly, I don't know why these ones are just so entertaining to me. It feels like a little side mission, disarming all these bombs, beating up the goons as the cop reacts in the same way every single time. That was fantastic, Spider-Man. I mean, thank you. That was fantastic, Spider-Man. That was fantastic, Spider-Man. That was fantastic, Spider-Man. It's a fun crime and used sparingly, which makes it even more fun when it occasionally pops up. It's too bad they decided to ruin it by including the fucking mobile game puzzle to disarm a bomb. Think that bomb's going off any second. Don't worry, sir. I've been training the arts of Spider-Man PS4. I got this. Bad time to get sweaty hands. Insomniac. In Spider-Man 2, what if we just took those puzzle sections what if we just lost the code for them? But the stupid puzzles are beside the point. I love this crime mechanic and find it to be a great feature with some minor issues, with the biggest being the fact that Jesus Christ, New York, calm the fuck down. Earlier, I said that these crimes occasionally pop up. Well, if occasionally meant every 12 fucking seconds, then that statement would be correct. Cause I guess according to Insomniac, New York is just a fucking war zone with people getting murdered and kidnapped in every corner of the fucking street. They spawned so frequently that at one point, the game couldn't keep up and literally spawned a crime in my face. 1043, reports of a tour bus taken hostage by escaped prisoners. Please proceed to Bowery. You know, maybe that's why there's so much crime in the city. Maybe these fuckers can teleport in and out, causing havoc at will. You know, this theory's actually supported because one time, when I was kicking their ass, suddenly everybody disappeared and teleported away. The thugs in this game have Doctor Strange magic. That's my canon from now on. Jokes aside, while at first these crimes are fun, they spam them way too much to the point where you get overwhelmed and annoyed and just start to ignore them. That is their one flaw. I'm glad the system is here, but Jesus Christ, if you would calm down, that would be great. How about instead of crimes appearing every fucking minute, we have one like every three minutes. That seems much more reasonable. Anyways, moving on to the next thing this game introduces during this tutorial section is the backpack mechanic. And as collectibles and video games go, these are certainly collectibles. 
By the way, I hate collectibles. Look, I understand the need for them in this game and basically every open world game now, but they have to be fun and interesting. And these backpacks aren't really that. I mean, the stuff inside them is kind of cool occasionally when it's not a drawing from a four-year-old, and they could give some cool insight into Peter's early days as Spider-Man and his first encounters with certain villains. That's cool, but they're also really boring to collect. There's only like 55, so it's not too bad, and they're all on the map, so you're not desperately searching every corner of the city looking for them, like a certain other hidden landmark. But it's not fun either, you web over there, click triangle, three-fourths of the things that you get from it are really boring, then do that 54 more times. And if you start thinking about it too hard, it literally fucking breaks Spider-Man's character. Like number one, why is Peter just clumsily leaving his backpacks all over the city? Like I get that being clumsy is a part of his character, but Jesus Christ, there's a point where you're clumsy and there's a point where you're fucking brain dead. Oh wow, one of my old backpacks from high school. One of my old backpacks from high school. Number two, Peter is fucking 23 in this game. How are all these backpacks still sitting around five years later? And number three, how has nobody found these backpacks yet? I mean, sure, some of them make sense. I doubt anybody would casually scale the highest skyscraper in the city on a weekly basis, but others have just been sitting in the middle of nowhere, very much in arm's reach for the past five years, and nobody has picked them up. Or God forbid, if one of Spider-Man's many super-powered fucking villains casually checks out what's inside one of these and finds items that can very easily be traced back to Peter Parker, such as a job application that probably has his name written all fucking over it, a picture of his parents, or his college badge that has his face and name on it. Gee, I wonder who Spider-Man is. Definitely not this prepubescent little boy. Actually, now that I think about it, if I was a villain and I found that, I probably wouldn't think he was Spider-Man either. I just found this backpack sitting outside some convicted murderer's house. Let's see, he had my birth certificate, my passport, my social security, my license, my credit card information. Is that my fingerprints? Anyways, enough ranting about useless collectibles. You pick up your first backpack and are greeted by 54 other ones around the city that you have to collect. Have fun, and after that, the next side mission is one that I all around love, which are the villain's warehouses. They're essentially just waves of enemies that you fight, six waves specifically, but taking into account how fun this game's combat is, it makes for a fantastic time. Unless you're doing a Sable base, then your thumb especially is not having a fantastic time. There's a decent amount of bases in this game. Fisk hideouts, demon warehouses, prison camps, Sable outposts, fuck the Sable agents. And despite all the gangs' fairly different fighting styles, they all play out in very similar ways. Sneak in, decide whether you want to take the first wave stealthy or not, I never do, so time to punch people for 10 minutes. And you'd assume that just fighting waves of enemies over and over again would get boring, but no. This game's base combat is so good that it's never tiring and consistently fun the whole way through. Hell, I'd go as far as to say that the bases are probably the most consistently fun activity that I look forward to the most. There really isn't much else to say about these. They're a lot of fun and carried by the game's fantastic combat loops, that's about it. And finally, the game introduces you to the last side activity, the landmarks, making you take pictures of famous landmarks in New York, whether they're real like the Empire State Building, or fake like the Avengers Tower. That is until Disney probably builds their own and makes it into a tourist attraction. I wouldn't be surprised if they did that. And I'll be honest, it's a collectible that I like much more than the backpacks. Sure, it's still just a collectible that you run over and pick up, or in this case, I guess, take a picture of. But it's fun seeing all these famous landmarks recreated in this game, and I love going to new places and being a clueless tourist, so this is right up my alley. Although I can't say the same about the secret photo ops, these annoyed the fuck out of me, and I was stuck on 49 out of 50 for like an hour until I found out that the fucking Statue of Liberty a million miles away was the last photo op, which made me salty as piss. And while the landmarks are the last side activities introduced to you in this tutorial section, there are two more introduced later in the game that for the sake of flow, I'm just gonna cover now. The first is Harry's research facilities that are scattered around everywhere, and you have to check these out and keep them running. These are side missions that I'm actually a fan of because they have you doing something different every single time. The only issue, and it's more of a nitpick than anything, is kind of just me poking fun, but when you think about it, it's very convenient that every time Peter visits one of these facilities, it's on the verge of fucking destroying everything. If Peter wants to go, I don't know, fucking masturbate to Black Cat for five minutes instead of visiting one of these research stations that's been sitting there abandoned for five years, then there goes Times Square, kaboom, bye bye. And that's not a joke, by the way. 
the billboards in Times Square were literally on the verge of blowing up. And if Peter went to go do anything else, then that would have been the city. It's a nitpick and I'm being an asshole, but still silly when you start thinking about it a bit too hard. But aside from that, they're good and creative side missions that I prefer much more over boring ass backpack number 47. The final side missions, and I saved one of the best for last, is Taskmaster who makes you do a bunch of challenges to learn your moveset and abilities. Whether it be combat challenges or stealth challenges where I just kick everybody or beat the clock challenges, they're all pretty fun, and if you're a completionist, you could try three-starring all of them if you care enough to do that. I tried for five minutes and gave up. Thank God you don't have to do that to 100% the game. But this isn't the good part of the side mission. By far the best part are the two boss fights you get into with Taskmaster during it. And honestly, it might be the best boss fight in the entire game. He is so fun trying to figure out how to take him out and dodging your own moves that he's using against you. It's great with the only problem being the fact that he constantly falls off the skyscraper, slowing the fight down to a crawl. The name's Taskmaster, and you're about to get taken to school. I have a bullet weapon that anything God damn it, Insomniac! Just add an invisible wall there so he doesn't fall. This is the one and only time I'll ever ask for an invisible wall in the game. But please, I kept accidentally knocking him off the skyscraper and it kind of ruined an otherwise great fight. And that's all the side activities in the game and kind of a mixed bag if you ask me. There's a good amount and enough here to fill up the game's length to make it worth $60, but I feel like they could have done much better. These side activities just get way too repetitive and tedious after a while and going for 100% completion just felt draining and honestly I started procrastinating because I didn't want to have to do it anymore just from the amount of side activities they shove in here and how same feeling they all are. Go over here, get a backpack, take a picture, oh the same crime up here for the 12th time in a row, take out those guys. I know it's just side stuff and you don't have to do it, but there's so many other games, Batman included, that make their side missions way better and way more engaging. Look at games like The Witcher and Red Dead where the side missions literally have whole stories that you could follow with interesting characters. The Arkham games too all have side missions that have plots that you could follow along trying to stop some big villain. Meanwhile here in Spider-Man you're just collecting some backpacks. And don't even come at me with those shitty blue marker side missions as if that's any good. No. Those are crap too. Okay they're slightly better because they have a minor story like with that college guy i guess but it's just as lazy and boring this guy's missing here's the last place he went okay let's go over there fight this horde of hypnotized guys this other guy's missing let's fight more hypnotized guys this other guy's missing more hypnotized guys the only good side mission in the game is tombstone because there that's the only one that felt like it had some actual effort put into it where you're fighting an actual villain not some random hypnotized college students. So if we had more side missions like that, I wouldn't be complaining. But what we had instead was finding Howard's pigeons. Blow that piece of junk out of the sky! What the fuck? But at the very least, doing all the side missions does feel a bit worth it because you get tokens that can unlock one of my favorite parts of the games, all the suits that are available. Holy shit! It's the guy from Fortnite! And after you go through the slog of getting 100% completion on the game, you unlock this suit. Why did I waste my time on this? I'm gonna give Insomniac some credit where credit is due here. I fucking love this system, and it actually makes having to deal with the hours of those crappy side activities worth it since you can unlock so many awesome suits. And I'm thankful that they didn't lock a single one of these behind a paywall like Arkham City and Knight did. Nope, you can get everything here for free, and then even more in the DLC. This was a pretty unnecessary part of the game, but I'm so happy it's here and it adds so much more content and makes the grind so much more worth it. And they even went above and beyond giving these suits their own abilities and things like that. If there was one thing that got me through all those boring hours looking for those secret photo ops and same feeling side activities, it was unlocking all these suits. But after introducing the landmarks and those other two extra side missions that were introduced later, this game is finally finished introducing the side activities and the main story finally properly starts back up as it introduces you to some more major characters such as Martin Lee and the demons who essentially become the main antagonist for the entire first half of the game. They're introduced interrogating a girl about a file for something called Devil's Breath. You use the shitty stealth to take them out, find a camera, and... Don't fuck it to Ginger! And here we go, probably my least favorite part of this game. Not letting you play as Spider-Man in Spider-Man. 
Now this is just a one-off section to introduce you to MJ's character and her skills as a journalist and stuff like that, then it would have been perfectly fine and enjoyable. But the problem is, this is very much not a one-off thing. Hell, it feels like every hour or so, the game stops the fun part in its tracks to force you to sit through the most generic stealth section in the universe that makes no sense. You're a journalist, MJ, not a fucking elite Navy SEAL sniper. How the fuck are you able to sneak past fucking trained super soldiers without anybody noticing multiple times? But lack of logic aside, from a pure gameplay standpoint, it, it's just shit. This is the most boring way to do stealth imaginable. Brain dead AI that would get distracted by a leaf blowing past them for 30 seconds as they stare off into the distance wondering what that was that you very slowly sneak up to before slapping them with a stun gun, and you don't even get the said stun gun until the second to last one of these sections, so for majority of them, it's even more boring as you're just sitting around for 15 minutes until the game lets you play the fun part again. Why? Why are you doing this? Why are you putting the fun shit on hold so we can slog through this for 10 minutes before allowing us to go back? Who over at Insomniac thought this was fun? Probably the same guy who thought the puzzle stuff was a good idea. But Insomniac must have thought that they were making the next big stealth game that would revolutionize the genre, because they not only did it with MJ, they did it with Miles also. And if you thought MJ sneaking past fully trained soldiers was ridiculous, just wait until you watch a fucking teenager sneak past those same soldiers, and not only that, but sneak past fucking Rhino. Got it. Sneak past fucking Rhino over here. No, no biggie, just another casual Thursday for Miles. Don't worry over here, Rhino, just destroy those boxes. Don't, don't turn around. It's not only boring game design, but it hurts the fucking brain, like Rhino. You're fucking Rhino. You're literally a walking tank with an indestructible horde. What are you doing wasting your time reaching into small floor panels? How about instead you charge through the entire fucking construction site and destroy everything in your path until you find this kid? You know, like you do in the literal next fucking game. Instead, he aimlessly just lumbers around, attacking any noise that Miles makes, creating a path for him to escape from like the big dumb idiot that he is, until Miles is finally able to escape by climbing over a wall. Because Rhino cannot break through that wall. Nope, that is made of the most secure indestructible material known as brick. Rhino cannot break through brick, it is impossible. It'll shatter his fragile little indestructible horn. Anyway, CLDR for Insomniac for Spider-Man 2. It would be really cool if the code was lost for this too, thanks. So after the introduction of the demons, the game basically entirely focuses on them for the next like six hours to the point where it really seemed like they were gonna be the main villain. I mean, they were slowly building up Doc Ock in the background. He was clearly slowly going a bit crazy throughout the course of the game, but that was in the background. For the entire first half, hell, maybe even parts of the second half, the game is entirely focused on the demons, which would be great if they were the main villains, but they're not. As you know, if you played this game, which I assume you have, if you've gotten this far into a spoiler review, the main villain is Doc Ock. So why the fuck would you build up the demons so damn much? This is my only real issue with this game's story. Other than this, it's fantastic and one of the best Spider-Man stories out there, but its pacing is pretty shitty overall. I mean, when you think about it, what happens? You start the game taking out Fisk, all right, that's the tutorial. Then for the entire first half, the demons are introduced and you're slowly trying to figure out what they want. Then they bomb City Hall, killing Miles' dad, which is a great scene, by the way. Also, as a side note, I'm a sucker for trippy dream sequences, and that dream sequence in this section was fucking awesome. Then you have Peter realizing that Martin Lee is Mr. Negative, so he investigates his office. You get this tense scene between the two where it's heavily implied that Martin Lee knows that he's Spider-Man. I don't think you or May have anything to worry about. As long as you stay away from places you're not supposed to be. Two fucking bad bats, never mentioned again. He interrogates a guy at a college party, steals Devil's Breath, which could potentially destroy the entire city. Oh my god, it's all the information on the top secret bioweapon Oscorp has been developing. Thank god they put it all in a fucking PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Maintain secrecy, if this gets out, could bring down all of Oscorp. Anyways, he nearly activates Devil's Breath at an Oscorp museum, so you stop him with the help of an MJ stealth section. Why are we still here? and get into a boss fight with him on a train, defeat him, and send him off to the police, officially ending the first half of this game. 
all that Mr. Negative stuff took place over the course of like 10 fucking hours. And this is a 17 hour game. That is a significant portion of time spent with somebody who's not even the main villain. It felt like Mr. Negative was originally going to be the main villain of the game, but last second they got a little bit nervous to have a C-tiered Spider-Man villain headline their game, so they quickly shifted gears to the safe option, which was Doc Ock. Everyone loves Doc Ock. Hello, Peter. But in this scenario, honestly, it might be an unpopular opinion, but I kind of feel like they should have just saved Doc Ock for the sequel and let Mr. Negative do his thing, go all out, make him a household well-known Spider-Man villain, like what Spider-Man 2 did for Doc Ock. I mean, you could make the argument that Octavius was built up, and he was, I'm not gonna pretend that he just suddenly became a villain. There are plenty of signs and hints throughout, I mean, you literally see his suit and goggles right there. This scene is pretty on the nose, but compared to everything that was happening with Mr. Negative, his descent to becoming a villain kinda got overshadowed. Still a great story, Doc Ock and Mr. Negative were still great characters, but it just had a bit of a messy feeling to it all. Anyways, I'm done fanficking and stitching together my own story, back to what actually happens. So Mr. Negative goes to jail in the ending of the first half, and begins the second, which is just absolutely batshit insane. Like, you talk about messy pacing, we go from one villain in the first half, to fucking six in the second. But I mean, it's not a complaint, the insanity was really fun to be honest. So after Mr. Negative is taken away, a prison break happens. By the way, this prison break mission was fucking awesome, but it frees a large chunk of Spider-Man's rogue gallery such as, Hello Electro, how come you're not blue? You chase him all the way to the roof and unsurprisingly it's a trap as Vulture, horny boy who can't stop a child, Mr. Negative, I'm so sorry for how they downgraded you, Scorpion, all appear to kick the crap out of Spider-Man, while Electro is in the background cooking Pete up the old Palpy special, hopefully he doesn't hit himself with it, you fucking dunce. But we forgot one more villain. Doc Ock, who finally appears in his villainous form, basically confirming who the main villain is gonna be. I'm so sorry for how they downgraded you. But jokes aside, this was a fucking awesome scene, and I love the Sinister Six, and I was not expecting them to form in the first game at all, so seeing them here was quite a surprising treat. And with all six of their powers combined, they're able to... Uh, chuck Spidey into a pool of water. After this, Doc Ock releases Devil's Breath on the Oscorp skyscraper over a bunch of his supporters, and somehow doesn't get infected. Like, the cloud spreads fucking everywhere, it's airborne, so there's no way that it didn't hit him. Was he holding his breath? I mean, he put a mask on, like, 12 seconds later, but it was already too late at that point. You are supposed to put that on before. That's not how airborne viruses... So this officially kicks off the second half of the game as you're trying to cure Devil's Breath by, you guessed it, doing fucking mobile game puzzles. Wonder if this is how they found the cure to COVID. Doctor. This outfit is in size XXL for some reason, and this hat's on too tight. Also, this is starting to turn into a pandemic. What are we gonna do? Stand back, gentlemen. I've played Spider-Man PS4. I got this. During all this Devil's Breath stuff, you're also working on taking out all six of these villains, which is pretty fun, but it felt a bit rushed. I kind of wish they ended the first half just a bit sooner, around the 7 or 8 hour mark, and gave the second half a little bit more time to breathe and more build up just because of how much stuff they squeezed in there. I mean, you might as well if you know that Mr. Negative isn't going to be the main villain. But now instead you take out like 4 of the 6 villains over the course of like 3 hours, mostly because they're teaming up which saves a lot of time. Start off with Electro and Vulture, which was a pretty fun boss fight, as they just zoom around everywhere, which can be a bit ridiculous when you remember that Spider-Man cannot fly, so him floating around punching the shit out of Vulture is a bit funny, but not a complaint, just kind of silly. It's fun and fast-paced as you dodge each other attacks, waiting for an opening to beat the shit out of them. I do kind of wish they worked together a bit more. When you boil the fight down, it's essentially just the two of them throwing themselves at you and taking turns at getting their asses beat, but all in all, a fun boss fight. The next one, I cannot say the same thing about. Rhino and Scorpion are teaming up, which is a terrible pairing because it's clear that these two do not like each other. Never send an eight-ton infant to do a man's job. Especially one who can't catch a 15-year-old. The fight starts out great, mostly because it starts off with my favorite, a trippy dream sequence after Spidey gets injected with Scorpion's poison. This section is great with Spidey swinging across the city with a pool of poison on the bottom, giant scorpion tail sticking out trying to murder you, and I especially love the little conversation Peter has with fake Octavius who blames you for becoming a villain which is essentially Peter blaming himself for creating Doc Ock. Pretty cool storytelling. And I also love the fight against like 
60 scorpion hallucinations all jumping and spam attacking the living shit out of you it's just too bad that the boss fight that follows it is pretty fucking lame it just basically boils down to you bonking rhino on the head with objects floating above him and punching him a couple of times while webbing up scorpion as the two constantly bicker for the entire fight what were you gonna do if i didn't show up beg him to give up yes god that is exactly what i would have thought <laughs> Get him, you idiot! Get him! Come down and help! Guys, please! There's plenty of me to go around! Stop blocking my way! Stop aiming right at me! So you guys and Octavius, huh? You have a name yet? The Scary Six? The Dirty Half Dozen? How about the Wee Murder Spider Man? His corpse for a fight! I mean, the fight literally ends with Rhino pushing Scorpion into a crate and the two getting locked in there where I assume Rhino beats the ever-loving shit out of Scorpion until the cops arrive. I, I'd i be surprised if Scorpion isn't a mark on the ground by the time that crate is opened. Nice no-kill rule, Spidey. You just gave Scorpion the worst kind of death sentence imaginable. So after that, we've taken on four of the Sinister Six members. So now it's time for the final two, the two main villains starting off with Mr. Negative and... Well, at least he got a cool boss fight. I mean, the gameplay is great, and it's a visually amazing boss fight and another trippy dreamlike sequence fighting him in his giant monster form with all these guys that try to overwhelm you. It's a really fun fight, probably the first or second best in the game from a pure gameplay standpoint. But from a story standpoint, it could have been so much better. I appreciate the fact that they try to add a bit of emotional drama into the fight by adding lines like Spidey trying to talk Mr. Negative down to get him to stop but it's too bad that he's quickly forgotten about literally as soon as you beat him and immediately overshadowed by Doc Ock. But I mean, there's a good reason he overshadows him. All the emotional personal drama that could have been added to the Mr. Negative fight if he was made the main villain was instead thrown in here, which works just as well since Octavius does have a connection with Peter. That scene where he revealed that he knew who Spider-Man was the whole time but still did everything he did was the absolute shit. I loved it. And the second phase especially, sure, it's really simple in terms of gameplay. I mean, it essentially bogs down to dodge and punch, but come on, you're on the side of a burning skyscraper, battling to the death, and just listen to the music. How can you hate this fight? It may be very simple in terms of gameplay, but the story told in the battle more than makes up for it, and the final scene between the two is fantastic. In the PS4 version, not the remaster, just keep your mask on. But after you defeat Doc Ock and have the cure to Devil's Breath, you go back over to Aunt May, who was infected by Devil's Breath. I forgot to mention that, but I assume you'd know otherwise. Why are you this far into a spoilers review? But Spidey has to make the choice between either saving May or saving everybody else. And I mean, well, it's pretty obvious what the choice is there. But damn, I honestly wasn't expecting them to kill off May in this game. It was ballsy and a really well done scene, but it didn't get me. It almost got me, but I didn't cry. I don't cry to old ladies dying. I cry at games about cats. Jokes aside, a fantastic scene. Also, Peter's new face has more emotion in it. That's why they want this new one, because it has more emotion. I think I had more emotion when I stubbed my fucking toe this morning. But that's the main story of Spider-Man PS4. Despite some of the pacing issues and areas where I feel like it could have improved upon the story, all in all, I think it was really good. Definitely one of the best Spider-Man stories I've seen in a while. And it's insane how much story they squeezed into just around 20 hours. Taking out Fisk, all the Mr. Negative stuff, the MJ Peter love thingy, Miles' origin, him getting bitten by the spider, Doc Ock's downfall, the Sinister Six forming, killing off May, teasing fucking Venom, which I am very much looking forward to next year. Hopefully it doesn't get delayed. Say what you will about the story, and I surely have, but you have to admit for everything they squeezed in, Insomniac did a damn good job at making a compelling and coherent story. I wish I could say the same about the DLC. So like every game that came out in the 2010s, Spider-Man PS4 had a season pass. The City That Never Sleeps DLC for $20 with three episodes that all came out over the course of holiday 2018. The Heist on October 23rd, 2018, Turf Wars on November 20th, 2018, and the finale, Silver Lining on December 21st, 2018, and there's no way that Insomniac made all these within the span of a month of each other, so these DLCs were definitely ready by September when the full game launched, so they very easily could have been included in the game as side missions, but hey, Sony's gotta make money somehow, I guess. The first of these three is real good, The Heist. I thought this one was really well made, but it starts off really weak. Why, you may ask? Well, because in the first 10 minutes, 
they throw you into this. Hey guys, check it out. I just got this new phone with a face ID. Watch. Oh crap, I gotta set it up. No, god damn it! So in order to hack in a door using fake fingerprints, you have to connect wires. I think they're starting to push the concept a bit. This is the worst way to start off your DLC, taking an aspect of the main game that was very disliked and instantly throwing you into it in the first 10 minutes of your two hour long DLC. Ridiculous. It'd be like including a 15 minute long stealth section in this DLC. But the actual fun part kicks off as a bunch of Magia thugs, which is basically Marvel's version of the Mafia, breaks into an art gallery. Classic Mafia stuff, and I say that as a white guy whose only connection to organized crime is an hour of Mafia 1. You take them out in the most messy way imaginable, like Jesus Christ, you might as well have just let them get away with the valuables at that point. It would have cost the museum less money. So you stop them and hello, Black Cat. You're hot. And from that point, the rest of the DLC basically revolves around Spider-Man chasing Black Cat around, trying to figure out why she's stealing these flash drives that are hiding in fucking paintings and books for some reason. Was that book in the library? It was just sitting on a shelf? Nobody noticed that when they took it off the shelves. Okay. And it's revealed that the reason she's doing it is because the mob boss Hammerhead has kidnapped her son and will kill him if she doesn't do what he says. And then she just leaves. There's this uh, other thing. You know that she and I uh, dated for a while. Yeah, so? Oh. Oh, are you serious? Wow. Didn't take you for the milk type of dad, Pete. So after this point, the DLC just... I wasn't expecting this. It just hilariously just takes the turn of Peter trying to desperately figure out if he's the fucking dad. So, about your son, is there a chance I'm- Later. I was half expecting this DLC to end up in paternity court the way it was heading. You are not- So because of this revelation that PD Boy has a shit pullout game, he decides to get a pizza and think about his life choices and the screen fades out. And instead of doing what you think it would do, which is fade back in and show an empty box of pizza to signify that Spider-Man ate the box of pizza, no, what the game does instead is uh, fade into an MJ section. I think I'd rather get a pizza than play this. So MJ hearing that Pete might have a son decides that fun is no longer available because her time is now and she puts on her detective hat and just fucking walks into a highly guarded Magia facility in the middle of fucking nowhere, expecting to find Black Cat's son in there for some reason so that she could see if he looks like Peter. What? How are you going to determine this? Are you just going to eyeball it? Do you have a DNA test ready? Are you going to use one of those apps to combine two pictures of them and see if it matches up? Oh, this baby looks like a child, and so does Peter. This must be his kid. Case closed. Kind of just seems like Insomniac needed an excuse to extend this short-ass DLC to two hours so they threw in this 15-minute long section to help fill up the time. I would have preferred a shorter DLC. So she makes it to the end of the Magia facility, doesn't find the kid, no fucking shit, but she does conveniently find a laptop that leads back to their distribution center, which you use to find where Black Cat's son is and team up with her to get him back in the only fun stealth section in this entire game because you team up with Black Cat. Sure, it's pretty lame and you don't actually get to control her, basically just point at a guy and say, take him out, but comboing your takedowns together is pretty fun. But once you get in there, she locks Spidey into a vault and reveals that there was no kid all along and she was just tricking him so that she could get all the flash drives and get away with the Mafia wealth. I really like that and it's a very Black Cat thing to do, and that's basically the end of the DLC. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, Black Cat also blows the fuck up. She died. She's dead. She didn't survive that. Nope. That that was dead in her face. You don't just survive that. So that was the ending of the first DLC, but there's still some more to talk about because this DLC actually has two new side missions, which are both new and original. Look at that. The first is a collectible one where you find stolen paintings from Walter Hardy, the original Black Cat, who apparently died in prison. It's essentially the same thing as the backpacks, but carried by this guy named Detective Mackey and the stories that he tells about the original Black Cat, before ending with a pretty cool twist revealing that he was Walter Hardy the whole time. Take care of my little girl. Yeah, um, about that. The other side mission in the DLC is Screwball, who is a parody of internet celebrities constantly making Spider-Man go through a bunch of bullshit to make her followers go up. She essentially takes the role of Taskmaster. Yeah, those two line up. Giving you a bunch of challenges to try to three star. Although where Taskmaster was cool, 
She is fucking annoying. I will admit though, her challenges are pretty creative. The photobomb mechanic for points is pretty cool and the challenges themselves like only being able to use two of your gadgets is pretty creative even if it can get annoying after a while. It was a fun enough side mission and a suitable replacement for the taskmaster challenges although it would suck if they decided to just copy and paste this side mission onto the other two DLCs like Turf Wars which is the second of the City That Never Sleeps DLCs and this one sucks. Now the heist DLC was a great start, loved the Black Hat character, they did her perfectly, loved the Magia gang war aspect and it was a great introduction to that side of the Spidey comics. And it was just an all around entertaining and coherent plot that ends on a pretty good cliffhanger ending that got me interested to see where the DLC was going and where it was going was off a cliff. The interesting dynamic between Spidey and Black Cat that carried that first DLC, is there any character introduced here that continues that dynamic? No. Unless you consider Yuri's weird and sudden addiction to wanting to kill Hammerhead as a suitable replacement for Black Cat. Which I don't because it was really fucking lame and also pretty dumb like why does Yuri hate Hammerhead so much to the point where she's willing to break the law to kill him. Is it because he tortured her in the beginning and killed like five of her men? I mean if that was the case then why didn't she get this bloodthirsty about Doc Ock because he fucking caused a prison riot probably killing like a hundred plus more of her guys. And even if Yuri's story was as interesting as Black Cat's which it wasn't, she only shows up in like three scenes. The first one where she's getting tortured, that was good and a good way to introduce Monster Mash. The second one where she just steals a cop car and fucks off while Spidey does nothing about it. And the last one where she randomly teleports onto the roof during the final fight and kills Hammerhead by shooting him in the head, but doesn't because he survived because electricity, I guess. Maybe in the Spider-Man universe, defibrillators can get a bullet out of your skull and heal all the damage done to your brain. I don't know, it's a comic book game. But I mean him surviving means that we'll see more build up in the last DLC where she'll finally get her revenge, right? No, she's not in the last DLC at all and is mentioned off screen in the side mission. I mean, the side mission kind of goes in depth into why she hates Hammerhead so much. I guess, I mean, we have that, but she also has nothing to do with him getting defeated at all. So what was the point of building this revenge story that went nowhere? The Turf Wars main story was bad. Now while the story was bad, at the very least the side missions carried this DLC. And I mean, well, you get an excuse to punch more guys in the face, so yeah. You get more bases in this DLC as a side mission, which is lazy, yeah I know. But like I mentioned before, this game's combat is so good that bases will never not be fun. Sure it's a copy and paste and just waves of enemies all over again. But if you just want some more playtime and things to do, then this DLC does that for you. And then there's the screwball missions. They, they just did they just did the same thing again. This is just them getting lazy now. And it doesn't help that they didn't even bother to create a new challenge type, just alterations to the old one, like different gadgets. And when you finally complete all the screwball missions, instead of stopping her, which is what you think is gonna happen, it's teased that she's gonna be in the final DLC. But if we collab IRL now, how will we ever make season three? You must be kidding, aren't you? You are tearing me apart! But all in all, the Turf Wars DLC, it's fine, I guess. It's just really disappointing. After the ending to the first DLC and how well made that one was, this one just seemed much more boring, lazy, and rushed in comparison. And it could have been so much better. Yuri's revenge arc was not interesting enough to carry the plot in the same way that Black Cat was able to carry the original. So in the next DLC, they tried what they did in the first by bringing back another more interesting character to spice up and carry the plot along, but this time instead of being Black Cat, it's Silver Sable, and you know what? It actually works. Not as good as the first one, granted, but I must say that the Silver Lining DLC was way better than Turf Wars. Similar to Black Cat, Sable shines here and carries the whole damn plot along, and it makes sense for her to be pissed off considering the fact that Hammerhead stole all her equipment and basically her entire fucking company. Way more sense than whatever the fuck Yuri was so pissed off about considering the fact that Sable's motivation is actually explained and Yuri's isn't until a side mission until this fucking DLC. A bit late there, aren't we? Maybe you should have put that side mission into, I don't know, the DLC that was about Yuri. But what this DLC actually does tie up is what happened to Black Cat in the shittiest way imaginable. She just appears, literally out of thin air, says, yeah, I'm alive, gives Spidey a flash drive, and then fucks off to, and this is not a joke, 
never be seen again. What was the point of making her such a central character in the first DLC if all she was gonna do in the climax was show up and fuck off within the span of 30 seconds? It literally feels like there was no planning that went into these three episodes. It all just felt like the devs were throwing ideas out there, hoping they'd know where to go with the DLC in the next one. Black Cat plays a central role in the first one, does nothing in the second or third. Yuri has an entire revenge arc built up in the second DLC. It isn't resolved in the third. And Insomniac panicked because, oh shit, people didn't like the Yuri story. So quick, uh, bring Sable back. Yeah, she's cool. I mean, yeah, she is. Like I said, she carried this DLC and is better than the second. But I don't know, the City That Sleep DLC was just really disappointing overall. And let's just not talk about Monster Mash Robocop. Cause that was the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. That boss battle was shit, and the entire character was shit, and that entire pl just let's let's move on. The side missions for this final DLC. The first essentially being more bases as you try to help a guy named David get supplies that the Magia stole. I mentioned earlier that bases will never be boring, but at this point the Magia have basically turned into Sable agents, so my thumb hurts again. The second are these crime scenes with interview tapes between a Magia leader and a therapist, which are actually pretty cool and explain why Yuri hated Hammerhead so much. Listening to these told a pretty cool story, and I'm actually pretty interested in seeing where they take Yuri in the sequel, as she essentially goes rogue and becomes a dirty cop by the end. And then the final side mission, of course, we have Screwball. And this is the third time now this character is annoying and I cannot tolerate her annoying voice any longer. Look, I know, Screwball's entire character is that she's an annoying fucking e-girl that never shuts the fuck up, but holy Jesus on a Christmas tree, Screwball never shuts the fuck up. Shut the fuck! If they wanted to make her as annoying as possible, they succeeded. But they succeeded so well that I am now holding the PlayStation button to switch out of this game and play something else, and I don't think the developers intended that. But aside from Screwball never shutting the fuck up, this is the same fucking thing. Literally the same list of challenges for the third time in a row. Your laziness is starting to show. At least we actually get to take her annoying ass down this time. But with that side mission, with Screwball finally taken out, Jesus Christ, I think that's everything. It makes me depressed to know that Screwball is the last thing that I talked about. Now the final verdict for this game is admittedly a tough one. I like this game, I really do. It's probably my favorite Spider-Man game and I do think it's one of the best superhero games around. But after playing through it a second time, going through all the DLCs, all the side stuff to 100% it, man, this game just has so many flaws that I didn't catch the first time. It is a good game. There is a lot of good here, no doubt. The combat is addicting. The web slinging is perfected. New York is recreated beautifully, even if it's a little bit dead. All the characters are the best versions of themselves. The story is great, and the other unnecessary stuff like all the suits is fantastic, and the fact that they're free just makes it that much better. But there are also so many issues like the poor pacing of the story, the stupid puzzles, forced stealth sections, lazy side content, and the all-around disappointing and messy DLCs just bring this package down for me. The best I can see someone giving it is a 9. If you just do the main story and don't care about anything else, I can understand a 9. That main story was great, but with everything in mind, 100% completion, top to bottom, main story, side missions, DLC, this game is a 7 out of 10 to me. It is harsh for a game that I loved, especially when it came out back in 2018, but going back to it now, there is a lot wrong that I hope they improve in the sequel. Make a tighter paced, more personal story, toss out all the dumb stuff like the stealth and puzzles, focus on the side content, give us more missions like the Tombstone one, that was great, and I genuinely can see Spider-Man 2 being a 10 out of 10, especially with Venom and the rumored co-op feature, I believe it'll be a good game, probably better than the first, and I'm looking forward to it in 2023. But as for Spider-Man PS4, it's a good but flawed game. All right, it's pizza time, and it only costed $14, plus another dollar for tax, plus another $7 for delivery, plus another $5 for tip, so $27 in total, but that's honestly more worth it than doing another one of those stealth missions. Let's dig in. Oh, you have got to be fucking shitting me. 